Hello, and welcome to the fifth episode of the podcast series, Engaging ESG. I'm your host, Kyla Fisser, and in this episode, we are going to be focusing on insurance companies, which is a new industry not yet covered in this series. Joining me in this episode is Charity Simamane, Associate Director in the Assurance Services focusing on the insurance industry. Welcome to the discussion today. Thank you so much, Kyla, and to your listeners. I'm really excited to talk to you today on this topical matter. Topical indeed. Taking a step back, I presume that ESG considerations are not a new concept to insurance entities, as the insurance industry is accustomed to reflecting the effects of climate change in their underwriting and reserving practices. That's correct, Kyla. Insurers have a considerable experience in incorporating the effects of climate-related risk in their assumptions that could affect the amount that insurers will need to pay to settle insurance contract liabilities. There are two types of risks, being physical risk and transitional risk. However, there, there is an increasing need to ensure that financial statements do tell a consistent and coherent story about how insurers are incorporating assumptions about climate-related matters in key areas of the financial statements affected by climate-related risks. What we are seeing is that investors need transparency about how insurers use information about climate-related matters so they can fully assess information in the financial statements and allocate capital according to their objectives. That's a very good point. As transparent disclosures would provide investors with enough information to understand, firstly, how climate-related risks, in particular the physical and transitional risks, are reflected in financial statements, and then also how the significant judgments and estimation of uncertainty regarding climate risks are impacted. Before we get into the details, can you briefly explain what we mean when we refer to physical risk and transitional risks? Thank you for bringing that up, Kyla. Because understanding the differences is critical, especially because transitional risks are less likely to affect claims liabilities in the short term. Differentiating um, the two is thus important. So physical risks are the direct effect of climate-related changes and can affect the likelihood and severity of claims made under existing insurance contracts. They can either be chronic, which would be the long-term effects of climate change or acute caused by ones of physical events such as the floods we recently experienced in KZN and the Nisna fires. In the non-life insurance space, these risks are relevant to both direct insurance and reinsurance. Both insurers and reinsurers were liable for the damages caused by the floods in KZN and the fires in Nisna. We've also seen instances where reinsurers no longer want to provide reinsurance related to thermal assets, being the assets in the supply chain of coal-fired power generation, due to its, to its impact on climate change. You may then ask yourself, what about life insurance business? Well, physical risks uh, such as drought and natural disasters we have seen on the continent can lead to direct effect on mortality and as a result impact mortality assumptions in the reserves for claims. I've said a lot, but in short, we have been dealing with physical risks over the years in, in, in the insurance industry, whereas transitional risks are defined as risks which translate into regulatory and social pressure to adapt operations and activities to mitigate climate change. In other words, the policy changes and economic consequences of efforts to decarbonize the economy. That's insightful. Thank you, Charity. Now that we understand what physical risks are, and that these are the risks that significantly impact the amount insurers need to pay to settle insurance contract liabilities, can you elaborate a bit on how it specifically links with ESG? Sure, Kyla. Generally, customers are increasingly considering the ESG impact when purchasing products and services. The same is true for policyholders when buying insurance products. If we consider the broad definition of physical risks, from a customer's point of view, better understanding of these risks may may impact the demand for coverage for such risks. This will then lead to changes in product offerings, underwriting, and pricing by insurers. These changes ultimately impact the quantum of insurance liabilities reserved for when insurance event does occur. 
Whereas transition risks, it's less likely to affect claims liabilities in the short term. However, transition risks may affect insurers through changes in migration patterns, which will cause demographic changes that affect all territories and have a consequent effect on assumptions about life insurance. For example, we are seeing some immigration in South Africa where employees are moving to different areas in South Africa, for example, to coastal areas, to enhance their lifestyles as they work remotely. A shift in consumer preferences towards more sustainable products Reputational risk can then arise as consumers examine more closely the sustainability credentials of companies. And the effects these risks have on companies' operations, including the useful economic life of assets in use and whether internal systems are advanced enough to deal with ESG-related changes in their business. Those are definitely valuable points to consider. Under transitional risks, you touched briefly on operations. My understanding is that insurers are also significant holders of financial instruments in the global economy. This means insurers will need to reflect the effects of climate-related risks in the measurement and in payment assessment for financial assets held to back the liabilities. Is my understanding correct? You are spot on, Kyla. From a measurement perspective, when instruments are measured at fair value, Consideration should be given to a market participant's views as this might include assumptions about climate-related risks as it relates to fair value. Matters to consider is whether fair value measurements using observable um, inputs might already appropriately reflect market participants' views of any climate change input as opposed to valuation models for items not traded in an active market. On the latter, Consideration will need to be made to ensure that valuation adequately represents market participants' assumptions. Where instruments are not measured at fair value, one should not forget to take into account climate-related risks when determining the expected credit losses. Lastly, insurers may be subject to possible actions by regulators as they respond to ESG risks, for example, whether they may disregard certain assets for regulatory reporting purposes, and also they may need to respond to the consequences of investor demand for ESG-linked assets and increasing consumer interest in investments that insurers make to back insurance policies. The implication is that insurers may face reputational damage by investing in financial and non-financial assets without con- considering the ESG implications of such assets. Earlier in our conversation, you mentioned that there is an increased need for the financial st- statements to tell a consistent, coherent story about how insurance incorporates assumptions about climate-related matters. In other words, sufficient disclosures as it relates to climate-related matters are thus crucial. You further touched on the fact that the assumptions about climate-related risks affect the measurement of insurance contract liabilities and the measurement of financial and non-financial assets held by insurers to enable them to meet the obligations to policyholders. This means that insurers will need to consider how climate-related risks affect the application of a number of IFRS standards. Can you elaborate on this for us, Charity? Kyla, I think it's important to note that IFRS standards do not refer explicitly to climate-related matters. However, in terms of the educational material on the effect of climate-related matters on financial statements issued in August 2020 by the International Accounting Standards Board, companies must consider climate-related matters in applying IFRS where the effect of those matters is material in the context of the financial statements taken as a whole. Information is material if omitting, misstating, or obscuring it could reasonably be expected to influence decisions that primary users of the financial statements make on the basis of those financial statements. For example, information about how management has considered climate-related matters in preparing a company's financial statements might be material with respect to the to most significant judgments and estimates that management has made. So you are correct in saying that insurers will need to consider how climate-related risks affect the application of a number of IFRS standards, in particular IFRS 4, or should I say IFRS 17, as it's imminent for insurers, relating to the measurement of insurance liabilities. 
IFRS 9 for insurers' financial assets, IS 36 for any impairments of non-financial assets, and of course, our favorite IS 1 for the presentation in the, in, in the financial statements are particularly re relevant. Thank you for that confirmation, Charity. I think the requirements of these standards are fairly familiar to us. Can you please explain how climate-related risks interact with these disclosure requirements? Climate change can introduce significant uncertainty about the future. Given the significance of financial instruments and insurance contracts on the balance sheets of, in of the insurers, transparent disclosures about those uncertainties and assumptions is thus important. Both IFRS 4 and IFRS 17 require an insurer to disclose information that enables users of its financial statements to evaluate the nature and extent of the risk arising from insurance contracts. Such disclosures should include the extent to which climate changes affect the risks arising from insurance contracts and hence the assumptions used to measure insurance contract liabilities. I know this is mouthful. In short, to comply the, the disclosures should include objectives, policies, and processes for managing climate-related risks arising from insurance contracts, information about risk exposures, concentration of those risks, and how these risks are managed, and disclosures of significant judgments and any changes as it relates to climate risks. What I'm taking from this is that while these standards requirements do not specifically refer to climate-related matters, they could be relevant where climate-related matters are material to the company's financial position and performance. Yes, exactly. It's the only way we can achieve transparent financial reporting, Kyla. We've covered a lot in today's podcast. We've started with some considerations of types of climate-related risks relating to insurers, We've also discussed how climate-related risks impact different line items in the financial statements and, of course, the related disclosure requirements for specific IFRS standards. Thank you for all your insights, Charity. It was lovely having you here today. It's only my pleasure, Kyla. Thank you for the chat today. This podcast is brought to you by PwC. All rights reserved. PwC refers to the South African member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com forward slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors. Music.